Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and it's an honor to have you with us for Living Divine Mercy. You know, when speaking about St. John Paul II, it's tempting, but we shouldn't start with all of his accomplishments, but rather with the fact that he was an incredibly holy man, a man of prayer, and a saint. According to John Paul's press secretary, his hour of private prayer, first thing in the morning, was the best part of his day. When visitors arrived to join him for Mass, they would say that they always found him kneeling in prayer. And some said he looked like he was speaking with someone invisible. Well, the reason for that was given by his best friend, Cardinal Jeevich, who reported that they would actually hear John Paul engaged in conversation with God when he was alone in the chapel. Can you imagine walking in and there's John Paul speaking with our Lord? The Cardinal said that he would pray for up to an hour in a trance, kind of trance-like state, without moving a millimeter. So prayer was the rhythm of his life, a life centered on the Eucharist. He made time to pray before and after meals. He prayed his divine office prayers throughout the day, which we priests pray five times a day. At six in the morning, at noon, and at six in the evening, he would stop whatever he was doing to pray the Angelus. And he prayed several rosaries each day also going to confession every week, and he did not let a day pass by without receiving Holy Communion. Each Friday and every day in Lent, he walked the Stations of the Cross, and during Lent, he would eat only one complete meal a day, and he always fasted on the eve of Our Lady's feast days. So just think, he did all of this while at the same time having all of his administrative duties and pastoral duties, which alone would have worn anyone else down. Now, each night, he would look out his window over St. Peter's Square there at the Vatican and out on the whole world, and he would make the sign of the cross, blessing the whole world good night. You know, one of his biographers noted that he seldom went to bed before midnight and he often slept on the bare floor. Witnesses report that he spent hours at a time and sometimes the entire night prostrate on the marble floor before the tabernacle with his arms outstretched in the shape of a cross. His aides noticed that he made all of his major decisions on his knees before the blessed sacrament. So while being a man of prayer, John Paul also accomplished some incredible achievements in his time as the second longest serving pope in history. You know, he warned of the dangers of atheistic socialism and along with Ronald Reagan, ignited the collapse of communism. He focused on true, not false, ecumenism by engaging Orthodox and Protestants in ongoing dialogue. He showed the world that even though they couldn't pray together because their beliefs were different, people of different faiths could at least be together to pray. I thought that was interesting. And sometimes, uh, yeah, this is true. We hear a lot of comments about John Paul's visit to Assisi, and some of those have become very hostile. Yes, I personally believe that he made a big mistake kissing the Koran and should not really have done it because it caused some confusion that he supported Islamic teaching, which as Catholics, we can't do. But in all fairness, we should also look at what John Paul's intent was. And his intent was one of living with our neighbors in peace, not a statement of truthfulness of the Quran. So please keep that in mind. Now, other noteworthy things in John Paul II's time as Pope was his response to the sexual revolution. He responded with theology of the body. This was a watershed work showing the beauty of marital love and how it imitates the Trinity. He commissioned the new catechism of the Catholic Church, which is incredible, um, presenting Christian teaching in a comprehensive and coherent, easy-to-read way. And perhaps the greatest achievement of all, 
John Paul II brought to the world an awareness of divine mercy and St. Faustina. Coming to know her as a young seminarian when he was clandestinely attending seminary in Poland during World War II, he would pass by her convent on the way to the quarry where he worked, and he would pray at her tomb. God then orchestrated it so that he learned of her writings and how it was God's will to have her spread the message of mercy around the world. Little did John Paul know that God was going to go so far as to make him Pope so that this mission could be fulfilled. When it all came to fruition, John Paul II said that he believed the reason he was made Pope was to canonize St. Faustina and institute the Feast of Divine Mercy. Wow. In fact, when both of these things happened on April 30th in the year 2000, John Paul II told us Marian fathers that it was the happiest day of his life. Amazing. And here's something else that's interesting. St. Faustina wrote about what many believe was her own canonization in her diary. In her vision, she saw St. Peter appear at the altar and whisper in the Holy Father's ear. Now, on this day of her canonization in 2000, it seemed John Paul was not going to make any statement about Divine Mercy Sunday. But then suddenly, he proclaimed it, proclaimed it as a feast and put it on the universal calendar. Now, you got to wonder, did St. Peter whisper in John Paul II's ear that it was now time to bring divine mercy to the whole world? Well, some people, including me, think so. That's because John Paul II said divine mercy is the most important message of our times. And he basically canonized the divine mercy message and devotion by declaring the second Sunday of Easter as Divine Mercy Sunday. You know, Jesus himself told St. Faustina, that divine mercy is mankind's last hope of salvation and that she would help prepare the world for his final coming. Now, how would she do that? Well, with the help of St. John Paul II. Jesus told her a spark would come from Poland, and that spark, we Marians believe, is St. Faustina, divine mercy, the Marian fathers to a small degree, and especially John Paul. He said that he believed divine mercy was his special task before God. He said that it is, it's as if Christ was saying through Faustina that evil does not have the last word. You know, John Paul died on the vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday in 2005. So it was actually Divine Mercy Sunday in many parts of the world, like the Philippines, and he passed away within, within one hour of receiving Holy Communion. So that means John Paul II died with the graces of Jesus' extraordinary promise of Divine Mercy Sunday, which is the complete forgiveness of sins and all temporal punishment due to sin, simply by going to confession, which he did earlier that day, and by receiving Holy Communion, which he did shortly before dying. In other words, he got his slate wiped entirely clean and was ready for heaven, just like you can be on Divine Mercy Sunday. Wow, it seems that God rewarded him for everything he did as one of the most incredible popes in church history. Now, let's watch a short clip of a summary of the incredible life of this amazing saint. This is about John Paul II. E io credo che questo è un kairos di misericordia. Ma questa prima intuizione l'ha avuto Giovanni Paolo II quando lui ha incominciato con la Faustina Kowalska, la Divina Misericordia. E lui aveva intuito che era una necessità di questo tempo. Kairos of mercy. That evocative Greek New Testament term that means a privileged moment uh, in God's plan of salvation. 
when Francis first talked about uh, the decision to call the Jubilee Year of Mercy, uh, he cited Faustina uh, and he cited John Paul II. So this is a case in which Francis is bringing to spiritual fruition uh, the instincts that a Polish nun had in the early 20th century, uh, and then a massively successful Polish pope brought with him into the papacy. I mean, you can connect the dots in a straight line, you know, from those instincts uh, to Francis's own emphasis on mercy. Ojciec Święty Jan, pa Jan Paweł II jest tym, który orędzie dane przez Boga ludzkości, przez siostę Faustynę, poniósł. Mówił o tym, że, że czuje się powołany, żeby nieść misję miłosierdzia. Sister Faustina is one of the great surprises of church history. Here is this semi-educated, utterly obscure, nun who has a remarkable set of spiritual experiences and out of that comes a transformation throughout the world. Jeżeli to wszystko zbierzemy, to można powiedzieć, że to orędzie świętej Faustyny było jak gdyby tylko takim wzmocnieniem tego boskiego sygnału który został wysłany Polakom i światu, w jakim kierunku należy podążać. Ale zarazem ten sygnał dał moc, dodatkową moc naszemu narodowi do tego, żeby przetrwać te najtrudniejsze momenty. Looking back at the 20th century, John Paul II described that there was a river of blood through that century. The Holocaust, the genocides in Armenia, in Cambodia, in Darfur, we look at the daily crime log, and so John Paul II thought that divine mercy was precisely God's antidote to the evil that was expanding like a cancer in the globe. John Paul II had been thinking about the divine mercy as the remedy for the moral uh, catastrophe of mid-20th century humanity. And in Dives in Misericordia, he proposes in Christ we meet both the face of the merciful Father and the truth about our humanity. And all of that reflects his understanding that what was given to Faustina was a message for the entire world. In April of 2000, Pope John Paul II canonized the first saint of the new millennium, Sister Faustina Kowalska, a Polish nun whose mystical writings and revelations reminded the world of God's immense mercy. For John Paul, divine mercy was the heart of the gospel and a roadmap to the future. Non si rivolgerà con fiducia alla divina misericordia. Si può ritenere un dono di speciale illuminazione, un raggio di luce agli uomini e alle donne del nostro tempo. After the canonization ceremony, he said, Today is the happiest day of my life. The greatest joy, I believe, is when we are fulfilling the God-given task that we've been given. And so for John Paul II, canonizing Faustina, declaring Divine Mercy Sunday as the second Sunday of Easter, I think he felt, I've accomplished my mission. April 2nd, 2005 was the day before Mercy Sunday. John Paul was dying and his longtime personal secretary, Cardinal Stanislaw Jeevish, set up the vigil mass for Divine Mercy Sunday. John Paul was going in and out of consciousness. And then he was conscious enough to receive a droplet of the precious blood at the time of communion. And then I think he died like a half an hour after that. I am utterly convinced that he wanted to hold on uh, until that moment came. I think he understood his entire life and his entire papacy 
as having been consecrated to God's mercy. Being able to give up that life on the eve of the Feast of Divine Mercy, he was able to offer that final sacrifice on the altar of mercy. Now let's go back to Scripture where we hear about Jesus' plan of bringing divine mercy to the world, and in fact, how John Paul played into that plan. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And he went to the synagogue, as was his custom, on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And there was given to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. He opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. When Jesus speaks about the poor, the blind, the captives, and the oppressed, he is not just speaking metaphorically about the spiritually poor, blind, or oppressed. Here he is reading a passage from Isaiah 61 that everyone in the synagogue would have understood as a prophecy of the work of the Messiah, who will usher in God's kingdom in every respect, not just in its spiritual dimensions. God's kingdom includes his reign over human minds and wills in faith, hope, and love, over human bodies in wholeness and health, and over human communities in justice and peace. In its service of the kingdom, the church is especially concerned for the plight of those who are most vulnerable or who suffer grievously. This preferential love for the poor is for those who are morally or spiritually poor, as well as those who are physically and socially disadvantaged. As St. John Paul II says, the Christian view is that human beings are to be valued for what they are, not for what they have. In loving the poor and serving those in whatever need, the church seeks above all to respect and heal their human dignity. Hi, I'm Father Gabriel Silla with the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception, and this is Ask a Marian. A question was asked, what does Be Not Afraid mean to me? Well, I love to think back to the inaugural homily of Pope St. John Paul II, where he said, do not be afraid, open wide the doors for Christ. It really resonated in my heart, and I love to think that the Lord really does live in and through us, and sometimes He uses us in extraordinary ways to speak to a group of people, and with a Pope, you can speak to the entire world. And I love to think how Jesus used Pope John Paul II to say to the world during that time, and we can still hear those words today, do not be afraid. You know, Jesus told St. Faustina that the world is not as powerful as it seems to be. Its strength is strictly limited. And St. John Paul II said that that limit is ultimately divine mercy. You know, Jesus told St. Faustina that the graces of his mercy are drawn by means of one vessel only, and that is trust. So let us not be afraid in this hurting and suffering world, but let us turn our gaze to our merciful Savior, Jesus Christ, the divine mercy himself, and say with all our hearts, Lord Jesus, I trust in you. Now let's go back to the Marian archives where we hear about a special table of experts talking about mercy in the pontificate of John Paul II. From the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy at Eden Hill in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, the Eternal Word Television Network presents Mercy Sunday. As you can see, our flags are at half mast today on this very special Mercy Sunday as we mourn the passing of our beloved Holy Father, Pope John Paul II. You see the statue in front of the Shrine of the Divine Mercy of Pope John Paul II on this overcast day as we celebrate Mercy Sunday with thousands of pilgrims here in Eden Hill, Stockbridge, Massachusetts. This crowds are gathered for the uh, rosary and uh, 
I'm happy to welcome you to Stockbridge today. I'm Father Joseph Roche. On behalf of the Congregation of Marians of the Immaculate Conception, welcome to Mercy Sunday. With me today is my co-host, Dr. Robert Stackpole, the director of the John Paul II Institute for Divine Mercy Studies. Welcome, Dr. Robert. Thanks, Father Joe. It's an honor to be with you again this year to celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday. But how special this year, because we not only celebrate God's merciful love, as we always do on this feast day, but also the incredible Pope that he gave, it, gave us. Just think about it. This is the Pope who canonized St. Faustina, the great apostle of Divine Mercy, the Pope who wrote an encyclical on Divine Mercy, the Pope who proclaimed Divine Mercy Sunday, the Pope who consecrated the whole world to the Divine Mercy a couple of years ago, and he dies by Divine Providence on the very vigil of the eve of Divine Mercy Sunday itself. Five years ago when he canonized St. Faustina and proclaimed Mercy Sunday for the Universal Church, he told one of the doctors involved with the miracle that led to the canonization, he said, this is the happiest day of my life. That's right, and, and we know from uh, the reports of the Holy Father's death that he received the communion for Mercy Sunday just an hour or two before he died. And so he received the graces of Mercy Sunday, and then he went to the Lord in heaven. So he'll be forever connected with Mercy Sunday. That's right, and we'll be looking to him as a great model and shepherd of divine mercy for the church for many generations to come. When the Holy Father visited the tomb of St. Faustina in 1997, he said, the message of divine mercy has always been near and dear to me, in a sense, it forms the image of my pontificate. That's right, and think about that. That means that what the Holy Father wants us to remember, the image that he wants us to remember of all that he said and did is the image of the merciful Jesus that was revealed to St. Faustina with those rays of mercy pouring out of his heart. Earlier in the show, we mentioned that in 2000, our Holy Father said that the canonization and the feast um, on Mercy Sunday that year was the happiest day of his life, and now he has died on the vigil of the feast. Your thoughts on the connection? Well, he's, uh, he's an actor and a playwright, and you wonder if he didn't stage this too. <laughs> but uh, God should listen to him. And, and because I remember when we were working on the process, he said, when should that beatification take place? Could be nobody but Mercy Sunday. When would the canonization take place? No day but Mercy Sunday. And here he leaves us on the eve of Mercy Sunday. I believe to emphasize to the church, this is not a joke. This is not my private devotion. This is the church speaking that what the world needs now. Mankind will have no peace until it turns their trust to my mercy. And to call attention to it is this feast that is to prepare the world for his coming. It seems now he'll be forever connected with mercy Sunday into eternity. There's no doubt about it. He said Providence assigned this message to him and the situation in the world also assigned it to him. He saw that already in November of 1981 when after the assassination attempt, he went to celebrate the anniversary of the publication of his uh, encyclical in Cola Valenza in Italy. And that's the first time publicly he mentioned that, that he knows this is for him to do by divine providence. He said that it really formed the image of his pontificate when he went to the tomb of Faustina in 1997. That's right. He recognized the, the signs of the times and he recognized uh, the force of her um, message. He did not obstruct anything or move anything further. He let the church investigate as the church needs to do it, and he only confirmed what was found. When he wrote the encyclical Divis and Misericordia, there was no mention of St. Faustina. It was from the church, from the scriptures and the traditions, but I think I read that he said he felt very close to Faustina at that time that he was writing it. Well, actually, he had not read her diary before that. And everything that he has in the encyclical matches perfectly what the Lord has given to Faustina. He worked in the quarry right at the bottom of the hill where Faustina was buried, and he would, on the way home, stop at the church uh, to, to pray. And he knew from his friend from the seminary that she was connected with this message, and he was captivated by it too, and, and uh, worked on it. And uh, he, he said at the final dedication of the Basilica, who would have thought that this young man in wooden shoes who had come from this work, would one day dedicate this basilica on this hill. Suddenly, God's presence took hold of me, and at once I saw myself in Rome, in the Holy Father's chapel, and at the same time I was in our chapel, and the celebration of the Holy Father and the entire church was closely connected with our chapel and, in a very special way, with our congregation. 
and I took part in the solemn celebration simultaneously here and in Rome. For the celebration was so closely connected with Rome that even as I write, I cannot distinguish the two, but I am writing it down as I saw it. I saw the Lord Jesus in our chapel, exposed in the monstrance on the high altar. The chapel was adorned as for a feast, and on that day anyone who wanted to come was allowed in. The crowd was so enormous that the eye could not take it all in. Everyone was participating in the celebration with great joy, and many of them obtained what they desired. The same celebration was held in Rome, in a beautiful church, and the Holy Father, with all the clergy, was celebrating the feast. And then suddenly I saw St. Peter, who stood between the altar and the Holy Father. I could not hear what St. Peter said, but I saw that the Holy Father understood his words. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us and talking about this great mercy Pope, John Paul II. Now, be with us next week as it's approaching Halloween, and we'll be talking about ghosts. Do they exist? And if so, who are they? So until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.